Okay, uh, good morning. So my paper today analyzes how actions define entities, such as props and characters in the game Gary's Mod. And I use the analysis of actions and entities to derive a socioeconomic reading of the game itself. So Gary's Mod, or Gmod for those of you who don't know, is a sandbox environment built as a modification of Half-Life 2 and comprises entities that have been ported and appropriated from all sorts of other games but generally devoid of the contexts and goals that once defined them. Gary's Mod appears to be the game that is played after other games have finished. Entities from other games are simulated in Gary's Mod, but it's up to the player to give them new meanings via their own actions. So in this paper I demonstrate how the software origins of Gary's Mod influences the modular narrative content that defines the game today. And I show how the structure of the game itself suggests two completely contradictory readings. The first is that the constant improvisation of new games and new modes of play seems to exemplify the ludic situationist utopia New Babylon, conceived by Constant Neuenhaus. And the second is that the spectacle of self-referentiality and pastiche in the game's ontology makes Gary's mod appear emblematic of the cultural logic of late capitalism as described by Frederick Jameson. So by analysing how player actions define entities in Gary's Mod, I characterise the game and its ontology and then adjudicate between these two readings. I then provide a reflection on this analysis and how the relationship between actions and entities is a powerful way to understand a highly configurable game such as Gary's Mod. So released by Gary Newman in 2006, Gmod is a modification of the world of Half-Life 2, transformed into an open playground that combines first-person gameplay with uh, real-time game-level editing. Whilst the single-player Boy's Own Adventure narrative of Half-Life 2 has been removed, a number of relevant structures remain in place, such as the narrative fragments of the Half-Life 2 lexicon and the predatory gaze of the first-person shooter interface. Modularity and the ability to evolve and iterate is a key feature of the Valve Source engine itself, which is what um, Gary Newman used to create Gary's Mod. Uh, the Valve Source engine debuted with the release of Counter-Strike Source in 2004, which itself was a player-built modification of Half-Life 1, and Half-Life 1 itself was um, largely modified on top of the Quake engine. Following on from the modularity of the game engine itself, Gmod uses a highly modular structure to encourage players to improvise their own games creating a milieu that is highly analogous to the ludic situationist society envisioned by Dutch architect Constant Neuenhaus in the project New Babylon. So to introduce what New Babylon was, um, or is, uh, from 1959 to 1974, uh, Constant designed an architectural structure for a new society, based partly on uh, Johan Huizinger's distinction between Homo Faber, man of work, and Homo Ludens, man of play, and partly on the theories of cybernetics developed from Engels to the Situationists. In Constant's scenario, the productive force of capitalism brings about the complete cybernetic automation of labour and administration, and uh, human culture is liberated, and, uh, man of, uh, liberated from work and man of play, uh, homo ludens, is actualised. So, for Constant, New Babylon was not a structure for change, but a structure built by a society that had already changed. It is comprised of modular sectors that can be reconfigured and rearranged according to the whims of this new ludic society. So in describing who a new Babylonian is, Constant writes that each new Babylonian acts on a milieu which is that of the others and elicits spontaneous reactions. Interventions form chain reactions that can only come to an end when a situation has become critical and explodes and then is transformed into a new situation. So this is the sort of world that existed within uh, New Babylon. He also writes, the culture of the New Babylonian does not result from isolated activities or exceptional situations, but from the global activity of a whole world population, with every human being engaged in dynamic relations with his surroundings. So there are a number of compelling parallels between the ludic society of New Babylon and the improvised play of Gary's Mod. The way that Gary's Mod is played is almost a mimic of New Babylon. The fluid transitioning between sectors and servers, the improvised moments of construction and destruction, bringing about the inevitable reset of the server or sector by administrative cleanup, 
suggests that Gary's mod, or the Gary Newman, may have unintentionally created a procedural New Babylon. However, as I mentioned before, there's a completely opposite reading. So in his 1991 essay, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, Frederick Jamison describes a particular qualitative definition of the term pastiche. Instead of the celebratory stylistic imitation, Jamison views self-referentiality in pastiche as symptomatic of a crisis in representation. So whilst for Richard Dyer, Richard Dyer or Charles Jenks, the evaluative nature of pastiche is less determinate, for Jamison, the significance of pastiche as a neutralized form of mimicry was profound. The obsessive reproduction of historical images breaks the Saussurian signifying chain, leaving a neutral language that circumvents our ability to imagine the future outside of limp visions of catastrophe. And this state of imaginative paralysis between the deluge of pastiche and the inability to see beyond the present is what Jamison called the moment of truth for postmodernism. So the nostalgic delight of sampling games and cultural images in Gmod um, could also be functioning as the ultimate signifier of global capitalism. So rather than see Gary's Mod's reconfigurable world of improvised play as a situationist utopia, Jamison's argument would identify the consumer's appetite for a world transformed into sheer images of itself and, <coughs> excuse me, and for pseudo events and spectacles. Rather than the post-revolutionary world of New Babylon, Jamison would see Gary's mod as the aesthetic of the revolution's cause. Prior to analysis, to me, both of these readings seem reasonable for Gary's mod. And the following section of my presentation will use the analysis of player action to determine which reading most appropriately defines the ontology of Gary's mod. Before analysing actions specifically in Gmod, I'll briefly introduce the ontological conditions in which these actions occur. There are two layers of rules in Gmod, the coded rules defined by the software, such as physics, object spawning, avatar death, etc., and the formal rules defined by players, role play and performance. And both of these layers enjoy distinct qualities of gameness. The coded rules of Gmod derive from the vulnerability of the Half-Life 2 avatar. Put in a simplified sense, if I fall, I die. In Half-Life 2, if I stop moving my avatar forwards, I stop triggering new enemies, and the game reverts to what Galloway calls the ambience act, where the game process is still underway, however the game has shifted into a purely aesthetic form of sights and sounds. When I move forwards, new game entities are instantiated, and the gameplay resumes. In Gmod, I can voluntarily end the ambience act by simply spawning hostile entities into my map and creating my own games. The coded rules of my avatar leave me vulnerable to attack, exactly like in Half-Life 2, and in essence, by spawning these hostile entities, I can create a Half-Life 2 themed survival shooter. In a more complex form, player actions with entities create the formal rules and the formal games that are played across the myriad Gmod servers. When analysing actions and entities in Gmod, we must also consider the semiotic meaning of these entities according to how the player experiences them. Whilst the instrumental rationality of playing Gary's mod as Gordon Freeman, Donald Trump or Pikachu might be identical, the semiotic pleasures will vary wildly. The orphaned ontology of Gmod must therefore be defined by the actions and sign relations that players themselves are producing. Thinking about how the player relates to the game itself, um, I looked at uh, Daniel, Daniel Vella's study of Dark Souls, um, where he quoted Husserl's notion that the world is the totality of objects that can be known through experience. And Daniel argued that the game ontology emerges via the player's cognitive intuition of the game in itself, which is moderated by the experience of the game phenomenon. But because Gmod forces the player right into the library of scripts and files at the back end, which I'll talk about later, we, I think we have to stretch um, Daniel's boundary of the phenomenal game object to encompass the entire computational game object as the game in itself that the player is playing and experiencing. I also think that because of the range of play activities that extends so far into modding, machinima and customised game modes, the concept of the metagame is similarly unsuited to this analysis. For me it just seems easier to say that all of these actions are different yet equally valid ways of playing Gary's mod. 
So in my paper that um, I've uploaded for the conference, I analyse five different types of player actions, but in the interest of time today, I'll only discuss three, which are those in yellow, which will be modding, performing, and the use of Gary's mod as a means of covert communication. Okay, so first I'll talk about the action of modding. One of the most visible results of player action in Gary's mod are the multitude of entities that have been uploaded into the game. So, oh, hold on, have I skipped a slide? Just let me... Oh, no, I think this is right. Okay, so um, I downloaded the modded Skyrim NPCs package, built and uploaded by the Gmod player Silverland. Uh, in this package, the meshes, animations and other data have been ported from the original Bethesda files and scripted and compiled to be compatible with Gmod. I can only estimate the accuracy with which these monsters have been ported into Gmod, so instead I conducted a comparative test to work out the parameters of one of these entities. Lacking the spells or magic I might have in Skyrim, it took me exactly 49 shots with my Half-Life 2 rocket launcher to defeat the Gmod NPC of the dragon Alduin. However, I was also able to kill this dragon with one shot from my modded GGN40 Skull Smasher anti-material rifle. I can shoot down a Half-Life 2 gunship with three shots from my rocket launcher, but the gunship is immune to any damage from my Skull Smasher. And the sort of stupidity of this experiment simply illustrates that it's obviously not the same dragon that it was in Skyrim. As a game that is made from other games, the representational logic of Gmod flattens all entities into a new common language. Gmod entities make semiotic references at both a representational and a procedural level, meaning that the player experiences not a dragon from Skyrim, but what a dragon from Skyrim would be like in Gary's Mod. So therefore I describe Gary's Mod as a game that simulates other games and produces new sign relationships based on how these entities are used within Gmod and the player's appreciation of cultural self-referentiality. As a second experiment, I made my own entity and imported it into Gmod. To learn how to do this, I conducted the Valve Developer Community website, YouTube tutorials and other Gmod forums. I exported a 3D model, colliders, animations and skeletons into the esoteric file formats used exclusively by the Valve Source engine. This relied on custom plugins written by the community to transform generic 3D files into the proprietary Valve formats. The process is described here. By working my way from a 3D modeling program to spawning my own custom entity in Gmod, I had to become familiar with an entirely new series of file formats, intermediary programs, script commands, and the detailed structure of my Gmod file directory. This mode of play not only required that the back end of the game software be brought into my perception of the game phenomena, but it also required me to rely on the entire ecosystem of Web 2.0 to engage in this particular mode of play. Hannah Veerman's analysis of game fandom introduced me to James Newman's explication of the term Game 3.0, which was initially used by Sony Entertainment to describe how they now design games with the assumption that Web 2.0 platforms will fuel extended modes of interaction, play and consumption of their games. Uh, both Veerman as well as uh, Ollie and Sebastian in their paper point out that the logic of Web 2.0 and Game 3.0 is also just the logic of neoliberal capitalism applied to computer games. So where platforms such as Facebook and YouTube generate revenue from the accumulation of unpaid human labour, it's natural that we see this similar effect happening in games. And in the case of Gmod, of course, we can see it in the blurring between gameplay and game design. In the language of Constant Neuenhaus and Johan Huizinger, the practice of modding blurs the boundaries between the categories of homophobe and homo ludens. So when it comes now to how actions define entities in Gmod, we could say that this form of modding not only conforms to the aesthetic language of late capitalism, but it exemplifies its pattern of production and consumption. <coughs> Okay, so the second action I will look at today is performative play. The use of Gmod as a performative medium is a large part of how it is played, consumed, produced and reproduced, and another visible demonstration of Game 3.0. Recording funny moments from Gmod and uploading them to YouTube is a vital aspect of how it is consumed. It allows players to teach each other how to play, and to share a mutual enjoyment in the absurd, hilarious and horrible moments that are collectively produced. Uh, in his research on Machinima, Gareth Schott argues that 
The hybridization of players, modders, and authors in a game like Gmod yields a collective autoethnography, dispersed across game modifications and machinima and all other aspects of the game. So, uh, the example on the screen, uh, the YouTube channel Vanos Gaming has over 21 million subscribers. It's an exceptional case of Game 3.0 logic that has allowed player productivity to result in enormous financial remuneration. So if Gmod lacked quantifiable outcomes in its sandbox gameplay, the subscriber and play statistics of YouTubers immediately introduces a certain definition of success and differentiates certain player effort from financial remuneration. Whilst performative play can have countercultural intent, it is universally funneled through a mass market where the remuneration of a minority of exemplary players, such as Gary Newman or Vanos Gaming, is far outweighed by the unpaid gameplay of the majority. And so this is uh, not a criticism of the Valve Corporation per se, I'm merely demonstrating how Gary's mod play exemplifies a broader socioeconomic logic inherent to Web 2.0, and how the socioeconomic context of Web 2.0 shapes the meanings of these game actions. So my first conclusion um, from this analysis so far is that a Gary's mod play is not a New Babylonian. Constant made it very clear that New Babylon was a reflection of a society that had undergone a ludic revolution and was emancipated from labour by this automated welfare state. Gmod players, on the other hand, are firmly grounded in their contemporary context. The actions of modding and performance illustrate how players are both playing and working within the logic of Web 2.0, where all input is constantly commodified. Any input can hypothetically earn an income, but statistically this is only guaranteed um, or the only guaranteed income is that earned by the platform itself, such as YouTube, Steam, Valve, or Face Punch Studios. To read these actions in terms of Jamison's definition of pastiche, we could say that the pleasures of recombining and building with this carnival of entities are ultimately a representation of the communicational and computer network of present-day multinational capitalism. From this reading, the material relations of Gmod actions are the aesthetic logic behind Gmod's cannibalization of other games and the sign relations formed by player action can only deliver pseudo events, simulations of simulations, and spectacles devoid of subversive or emancipatory potential. However, the final action I'll present today challenges this first conclusion. And this action is the use of Gmod as a covert channel of communication. So at the 2012 International Conference on Security and Management, a team from Rochester Institute of Technology analyzed Gmod as a potential channel of covert communication. The client render model of multiplayer online games such as Gmod means that player interactions occur on the server, but the rendering of the visual environment only occurs on the player's computer, which opens the door for such games to be used as visual channels of covert communication. To illustrate their point, the authors devised a simple system where one player spawns a group of barrel entities, each with their colour values altered on the red, blue, green and alpha channels. Because RGBA values can be decoded into integers between 0 and 255, the coloured barrels can form a numerical code where numbers represent letters and words. Thus, by temporarily spawning a set of coloured barrels, two players could be exchanging a hidden message that would not be recorded anywhere on server logs. By logical extension, the authors of this study argued that the entire landscape of Gmod could be utilised as a covert stenographic language. Whilst obscure, and certainly not a paradigm game action, the repurposing of Gmod as a secure channel of communication is highly significant. One of the fundamental shifts of Web 2.0 was the acknowledgement that privacy and anonymity have been obliterated by surveillance and algorithmic targeting, made clear by the Snowden leaks in 2013. If Gmod is used as a tool of covert communication, we can no longer describe an entity as only the neutralised language of postmodern pastiche. Whilst this activity is obviously not that of a new Babylonian, it illustrates that Gmod can be used to emancipate the player beyond the Web 2.0 conditions on which the game is based. The expanded gameplay afforded by the configurable nature of Gmod means that, despite my initial characterization of neutralised pastiche, we cannot completely predict what meaningful expressions might emerge from it. 
Okay, so my conclusion number two is that uh, from this analysis, it was possible, um, due to the highly configurable nature of the game, that my initial finding, because so many GMOD actions exemplify the logic of 2.0, uh, Web 2.0, they were most accurately described as representations of the contemporary socio-economic climate, and therefore appropriately read through the logic of Jamisonian pastiche, rather than through the revolutionary ludic vision of Constant Neuenhaus. But this reading was destabilised by my final action which I encountered, which led to the second conclusion. The use of Gmod as a covert platform foreclosed any ability to define the game as an entirely postmodern spectacle, because this action directly contradicted the logic of Web 2.0 and contradicted Jamison's prediction of a neutralised language. So in conclusion, my finding demonstrates that any highly configurable game such as Gmod can result in highly unpredictable actions and that any adjudication of such game must be prepared to find an action that can fundamentally destabilise any pre-existing critique. Oh, and that's the end. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. We have nine minutes left for questions. Yes. Hi, that was a fascinating paper, thank you very much. Um, uh, so a slight, slightly critical question, uh, and although well, mainly just exploratory, because I know very little about the idea of New, ba New Babylon. Uh, so I'm working more with what I do know about, say, post-scarcity uh, of fiction, which is, it seems like it's a similar sort of idiom. Um, the fact that, that there's resource appropriation and accumulation of resources by these platforms, like YouTube, through the use of Gary's Mod, uh, it doesn't seem to me to disqualify uh, Gary's mod from, from being this kind of utopia, except for the fact that it happens to be embedded in, in, in a capitalist society. Many of the uh, visions of post-scarcity economies that one reads about in science fiction, for example, and I don't know whether Neuenhaus uh, recapitulates this himself, but they have activities which mimic resource accumulation and, 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 and the vast inequities of capitalism. It just doesn't matter because everybody has a house and medical care um, and, and three square meals a day. Uh, and the fact that players of Gary's Mod, in fact, don't inhabit such a world uh, seems like it could be an extraneous feature of the game itself. Well, at least one could imagine something like Gary's Mod coming into existence in a post-scarcity environment. Um, does that undercut your reading at all? Or, 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 or um, could you clarify a bit the point you were trying to make in disqualifying Gary's Mod from being a new Babylon? Sure. Um, well, again, I was focusing on two particular poles to read it between. And... The pole of New Babylon was definitely sort of a society that was a sort of an architectural cartoon of a, a base and a superstructure, and that this was the material existence that resulted in a culture of ludic play. Um, and the entire point of that was that this only exists after, uh, you know, it's essentially an architectural realization of um, Marxist theory of capitalism. That the contrast to Gmod is that the subjects playing are not in that society. So they're, to me, they're playing a simulation of these activities that might also be defined by material relations that are completely separate from what they're doing. So to me, that, that division I don't see being disrupted by perhaps there being other utopias that might be, say, um, you know, a, a commune can be, a nest, can be nested within any society, sure. But that wasn't the example I was working from. It was um, looking at something that was describing an activity that looked exactly like what was in the game, but using the logic in which it was described was definitely not something that could, according to Constant, exist now. It is a, a reflection of a change that has already happened. So that's why I was sort of um, drawing that line between the context of the players compared to the similarity in the activities on an aesthetic level. Just a very brief follow-up then. So, so if the socioeconomic conditions that the Newen House was, was, had one eye towards suddenly obtained, um, and one found that Gary's mod was, was being played after those conditions uh, were uh, obtained, if the game didn't change at all, would it then, still, would it then qualify as a kind, of, a kind of new Babylon? It's a complicated thought experiment. Yeah, well, I think the thought experiment would be that in, in Constance's vision, in some of those quotes I mentioned earlier, the notion of individual authorship is also eroded because, um, 
you know, these, these things are no longer quantified by, you know, individual remuneration, etc. So I think that's why I described Gary's mod as a simulation of New Babylon rather than New Babylon itself. I think if, if we are running the thought experiment of Neuenhaus, then we'd say that the society is Gary's mod. And the games that are played in Gary's mod might be, or the games that are played in, in New Babylon might be more similar to the individual servers that exist uh, on Gary's mod, where people play temporary games within the overarching umbrella. That would be the parallel, if that makes sense. Any further questions? Yes, please. I would like to ask you, how is that different, for example, for, for, from other sandbox games that are not, um, that don't allow uh, this modification that Garry's mod uh, allows? For example, Minecraft that has mods of, it, of its own, but it's still free and uh, mm. can be really repurposed. And uh, I mean, if there's a few other examples from architecture that might be interesting for you to uh, compare as, uh, like you did with Constant. Uh, one is the Fun Palace from Cedric Price, which is more like a, a structure of play. And then a newer one is uh, I've heard about from Francois Roche, uh, which I think plays around this uh, notion of post, uh, post uh, scarcity, and also has a procedural uh, contract of uh, people living there, which might be interesting. Okay, I might chase those references up from you. Um, yeah, the the one thing I didn't do in this paper because it just wasn't what I was looking at was a whole deal of comparative analysis to similar games because I was I would assume this paradigm exists in various modulations in similar games that wasn't the, the aim was simply to adjudicate a reading of this itself um, in terms of certain differences I, I picked this because it it's sort of an extreme case where its aesthetic is such a sort of Frankenstein of other games that that um, that was just very useful. Um, like I like going onto Minecraft servers in Gary's mod, and that is always that that I quite enjoy. That it it will completely morph itself into as much as it can into the aesthetic logic of another game, even though it will hit the limitation of the engine. So you can't have that sort of so that voxel based ability to sort of dig through the level doesn't exist in Gary's mod. So they'll get to a point, and then the joke is complete and then you move on. But um, yeah, I think if I was to do a comparative study of lots of different sandboxes, that to me is a, is a different paper, I think. We have time for one more question. If nobody has one, I totally have one. Um, <laughs> Just a very simple thing. Um, I would probably, in a different context, maybe in yesterday's workshop, very much contest the idea that Gary's mod is well qualified as a game. Mm -hmm. And it might be one of those phenomena that get recontextualized as a game because there's so much embedded in gamer culture, because you get them on Steam, for example. And mm -hmm. then you show us that wonderful example in the end about using it in, in an in a experiment to, yeah, for covert communication. So we have something here that is not inherently a game that then becomes recontextualized as a game and then becomes recontextualized as a misappropriated game. Mm. How much does that figure in, that weird ontological status of what Gary's mod actually is, mm. apart from what it uses as its materials? What I, what I tried to argue in the beginning of the paper was that at its basic level, before games within other games have been instantiated, to me, it it maintains most of the qualities of Half-Life. Mm -hmm. So if I was to accept Half-Life as a game, I'd accept Gary's Mod as a game. It, on the sort of faint kind of, uh, well, the, the very thin ice of the character can die if I fall over too many times, and that walking forward in Half-Life and instantiating an enemy has, to me, a voluntary similarity to just adding an adding an enemy in yourself that though that was a sort of before doing anything mm -hmm. that was the commonality that i saw that even the way that all the avatars are constructed i think your character is tougher than in half-life you have to fall a few more times to die but essentially all the material is the same stuff and i think um i was looking at the relationship between that 
and the ambience act of the game as being so similar that I would be more concerned with arguing for the gameness of Half-Life 2 okay. than for that of Gary's mod. Okay. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>